Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Heavenly Father, what a what a wonderful and beautiful place we get to when we realize that we are desperate without you. Lord God, in our lives, when we are apart from you, when we are distant from you, when we are not completely plugged into you, Lord, we're desperate. Things aren't working. Things aren't going right. So Lord God, each of us goes through those seasons and those times. Help us to just completely rely upon you. Lord God, we're crying out to you right now. Lord God, saying we are desperate. We're desperate as individuals. We're, we're desperate as a, as a body. We're desperate as a nation. We're desperate as a world. And Lord God, it is not you who changes and leaves us, but it's us who changes and walks away from you. So Lord, as you are calling us back to you, Lord God, help us to, to just to run full speed, full force, back to your presence. Jesus, be glorified today. Jesus, we lift your name on high, high above all, above everything. And Lord God, thank you that we may call upon your name in, in a desperate and dying and chaotic world. Lord God, we can call upon your name. Praise you. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in that mighty, awesome name, Jesus, Jesus. Everybody just say that with me. Jesus. What a wonderful word. What a wonderful name. Jesus. Pray all this in your name, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. Awesome. All right, let's let's get the kids out of here right away. Kids, you go, you go have fun. Be loud, be noisy, have a blast. Thank you guys for being patient and understanding with us. I think it went pretty good without having any words up there, right? It's not something we want to do every Sunday, but we can do it. We can get through it. Couple quick announcements. Um, it's super important to read your bulletin, especially today since we don't have uh, any announcements running, but a few things coming up. We got the 24 hour prayer coming up uh, the 19th that starts this Friday, right? This Friday, and I was looking through the sign up sheet, and there are a few openings still. There's some openings on here that we need to, to fill in. So I'm going to pass this around. Somebody want it? I'll th can I throw it? No, I better not throw it. I might take somebody out the way this morning's going. Um, they're all pretty good slots. All, I think all the uh, middle of the night slots are taken. So uh, these are more of the cushy slots. So sign up. Um, if you've never done it before, just come on in for an hour and pray and, and see what God uh, has to say to you. So it starts at 7 o'clock this Friday, and then at 6 o'clock on Saturday, we're going to come together and have some worship and have communion and that. So uh, um, instead of starting out with, with worship, this time we're going to finish with worship. And we're just going to see, see what God does, see, see how he talks to us and all of those things. So that's this Friday. And then we've got the Bridge Builders game night coming up on the 26th. Woo! Who said woo? Woo, woo! Everybody says woo! Um, 6.30. Starts at 6.30 here at the church for game night. There will be games here. If you want to bring a game, bring it. I, I would envision a bunch of different games going on all at the same time. Yeah. So it'll be fun. Um, all that good stuff. And then the annual business meeting. Yeah. I'll try it again. The annual business meeting. Woo! Yeah, that's coming up on the 28th. Um, so we'll do service on the 28th and then we'll have a meal downstairs. It's not a potluck. You just come in and enjoy. You don't have to bring anything, none of that. You just come in and, and, uh, we'll all eat together. Then we'll come back up here for the, 
the business meeting. It shouldn't last more than, I'm going to say, six or seven hours. <laughs> um, actually, it won't. It'll only feel like it's six or seven hours. Now, our business meetings aren't bad. Um, been a crazy year, this, this, this past pandemic year, COVID year, so uh, who knows what the business meeting will look like. But we do have a, um, a couple seats to fill on the leadership board, the, the deacon board. And since we redid our bylaws and we, we voted those bylaws in, um, we left how we do elections kind of open um, so we're not stuck into one thing. Uh, so this year, we are, instead of doing it like we typically do it, this year we're going to do it more like how you would elect a pastor into a church, where when you go to elect a pastor, you, you, it, pastors narrowed down to one, and then people vote on that one, one pastor, and he either gets a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, we thought, well, hey, if, if we do it for pastors, why couldn't we do that same thing for leadership and deacons? Uh, part of the reason for that is that way no one's like, hey, I didn't get voted in. And sometimes that can mess with people's heads and, and things like that. So how we're doing it this year is, is um, Doyle's uh, term is complete, but he has the option to run again, and Doyle has said that he wants to have his name up again, and then we have another open seat, and Doug Strong has graciously, actually, no, no person has ever <laughs> asked more questions and just wanted more information than Doug, and I appreciate that. I think that's a great thing. It's right. It's like, I like this. It actually, it's like, hey, you want to run for the board? I guess. Why not? I don't have anything else to do. No, not that anybody does that. But Doug was like, wait, what about this? And what about this? And what, what about this? And can I come to one of the meetings? And this and that. It's like, Doug, man, awesome. I love that. So, uh, so how the elections this year for that will look is, is uh, two seats open. There's two names. And we either vote a yes or a no. And then if it's a no, if people are like, man, we don't want that person in, then we'll go back and we'll, we'll re, um, not elect, but we'll put another name before, before you guys and, and things like that. I don't expect it to be a, a, big, a big issue or a big deal, but uh, um, we wanted to try that and see if that doesn't um, just keep... I don't know, the body together in, in, in a little bit better way. Um, offering, we've got offering today. As you can't see on the board, we've got three ways to give. Um, you can give online, uh, bridgehelena.com. Go to our giving page. You can give in the giving boxes that are behind us. Um, there's envelopes there. Be sure to designate if you want to designate an offering. Of course, your tithe is your tithe. Or you can mail it. You can drop it by. You can do all of those things. But let's continue to give and, and see how God uh, blesses us in those things. Let's see. Have I forgotten anything? Oh, wait. I forgot one thing. Somebody else's birthday is coming up. Dave's birthday's today. Debbie's was yesterday, right? I don't. What's the deal with all these Valentine's Day? They, but we have another birthday coming up and on Tuesday, and it's one of those great birthdays that has a zero behind the first number. And, and that's that's Amy. Amy's birthday is coming up, and it has the zero behind it. But I'm not going to say what numbers before it. So, so twenty. 20, 20, 20, that'd be a little weird because I have a 20 year old, so maybe 30, 30, and I hear 30, it's like an auction, so everybody tell, you know, when you're leaving today, Dave, Debbie, Amy, anybody else have a birthday right around these days, Beth, Beth. 24th, 24th. hey, Valent, it's February's a good birthday month, so Awesome things going on, right? Good things going on. Hey, if you guys were here last week, <laughs> if you guys were here, we're going to get serious now. We're going we're gonna to have church now. <laughs> right? Now, actually, let me pray because I need to pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, Lord, you throw curveballs sometimes, and yeah, that can get me a little 
messed up, and it's only technology. So Lord God, help us not to depend on, on those external things, but help us to only depend upon you. Holy Spirit, have rule and reign in this service, Lord God. If, if you need it to go off track, if you needed the video to be messed up, whatever it is, we trust you. So Lord God, everything that I say, let it, let it be from you and you alone. If you want me to say it, let it be said. If you don't want me to say it, shut my mouth, Lord Jesus. We give all of this to you and we give glory to you. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. I am so glad that I get to stand today. I might wobble around a little bit, but I'm going to try to make it through. It's going to be good. How many of you guys were here last week or listened online? Everybody raises their hand, right? Remember, we talked about um, just this idea of, of sharing our story. That's kind of how we, we wound that up. And we, we talked about how important it is to to understand that each of us have a very amazing and unique story. And within that story, there can be some pain. It can be a reflection of what we used to be versus how we are now. It can be all of those things. Um, and then I ended, I, I asked you guys, hey, would you, would you begin to think about that, discuss that, talk about it, pray about it, and begin to write those stories down? So how are your stories going? Has anybody actually written anything down? No. Yeah? We're afraid to raise our hands, though, right? I want to keep encouraging you to write your story down. Just get it on paper. It doesn't have to be perfect, man. Maybe you start halfway through the story. Now, I'm going to start where, where I met Jesus. Start there. You can go in and fill in before you met Jesus. Or you can talk about how, man, Jesus healed me in this. And then go back and talk about what it is that he actually healed you. There's no right way to do it, but I'm just asking you guys, it's so important. Write those stories down. Get them down on paper. It's amazing. If you guys have ever journaled, you know this. Once you start writing things down, it's like, wow, where'd that come from? And it's just, it just flows out. You just start writing, writing, and you go back and read it and think, did I actually write that? There's a way that the Holy Spirit affects us both when we speak and when we write. So I'm asking you guys, write it down. It'll be awesome. We are starting a new series today, and I'm kind of excited about it. We just wound, uh, wrapped up 10 questions that Jesus asked. Now we're going to transition and talk about 10 statements that, that Jesus spoke. So today is going to be the first of those. And I just want to start it out by, by talking about my own life um, Within my own life, I like solid, right? I like solid things. I like, I like these rigid and these, these tangible ideas and statements. I, I am not big on surprises. Like to throw me a surprise party, um, nine times out of 10, I'm gonna know because I'm gonna watch and clues. And so Amy doesn't even try, she doesn't even like, like that. But I just don't like surprises in, in general. I like plans, I like details, I like, I like outcomes. That's why this morning when the pro presenter went haywire, that was a great surprise on a Sunday morning. So, and that it was like 20 minutes before service and it started, I hate that. I don't roll with that very well. I tend to over-research things, right? If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna buy something, say I'm gonna buy a new, a new fly rod or something, which I would never do, I would never buy a new fly rod. But say I was gonna buy a new fly rod, I'm gonna research that thing. I'm gonna compare like five different comparable fly rods and I'm gonna say, okay, which is the best at this, but which would be the best for me now? Which is the best price? And, and it's crazy. It's like, can't I just buy it? No, I got to over-research it. And that's with everything. See, I want to know how things are going to look before I start to do those things. I'm probably just a, a little bit over-controlling in that. Um, but knowing and preparing for me that brings me security, to know what I'm getting into, to over-research, to prepare for it, and to really have an understanding of how things should look at what time intervals. That just, that makes me feel secure. And within that security, it helps me to really feel safe. That's me. That's just who I am. And that's how I'm wired. But I also know that uh, people are wired very differently. And because God makes us all unique, 
there is no one right way to be. Not one of us does things the exact correct way. We're just different. We do things differently. There's those people that are like, hey, they get an idea and they've done it before they even think it through. And it's like, man, that's a whole lot of freedom. That's not me. But that might be you. With that being said, I also believe when it comes to God, that is all of us. This is universal to all of us. Despite how we are wired, we all long for the absolute truth that only God can provide. Yes. Regardless of how we're wired, there's something within us that wants, that, that wants something solid, something absolute. Though there are times and seasons that we go through in our lives where we may not like his truth, right? Have you ever been there? You ever been in a time or a season and it's like, God, man, I don't like that. I don't need to hear that right now. I want to do it this way. See, we can even try to question his truth at times, but there comes a great security in knowing that despite, despite human achievement, evolution or, or moral reprogramming, despite my struggle with understanding completely what the word says, there does in fact exist absolute truth. And that brings so much security into our life. And that makes us feel safe. Aren't you glad that you serve a God that is absolute, that you can believe, that you can trust? How does that actually make you feel? Praise his name. See, there is more uncertainty in the world right now than ever before in history. Ever before. You don't believe me? Take a look outside. Look at social media. Look at the news. Look at what is going on around the world, especially, especially here at home in our own country. There is so much uncertainty. Whereas absolute truth brings security and safety, uncertainty brings chaos and fear. Today, as we start this new series, 10 Statements of Jesus, we have an understanding that, that all the statements that Jesus make are foundational, right? They're fundamental. They're forever statements, and they never change. That's the unique thing about, about the word. It, it, it doesn't change. Despite what year we're in, despite what, what technological advancements or what science has, has discovered, the word of God never changes. Statements that we can have confidence in and assurance that, that they will never change. Isn't that, isn't that nice to know? That, that if Jesus says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the son of God, it, through me you get to the Father. We know that that's an eternal statement. That is not going to change in a decade and we got to reevaluate our faith. Oh, I got to do something different now? It's not like that. It never changes. So are you ready to grab hold and to come into the beauty and security of these statements? Yes. That's what this whole series is about, is, is hearing these statements, reading these statements, beginning to get a deeper understanding about these statements and, and coming into that and really, really seeing how amazing God is, how amazing his words are, how beautiful Jesus was when he spoke these words. Statement number one, what we're going to look at today is what I would call an essential proclamation that encapsulates the gospel of Christ and the basis of true Christianity. Did you get all that? Let me read it again. It's an essential proclamation that encapsulates, encapsulates the gospel of Christ and the basis of true Christianity. Now, it makes me sad that I have to differentiate Christianity and true Christianity. But in today's religious landscape, I, I do feel that it is necessary. Yes. The difference between the two has everything to do with the absolute truth that is found in the fundamental <laughs> statements that Jesus speaks in his word. Yeah. See, there are some religious institutions and pastors that are actually uh, questioning 
the statements of Jesus. They're rearranging the statements of Jesus. They're saying, well, Jesus made that statement, but he didn't really mean that statement. We throw all that out and we say, what's the word say? What does Jesus' statement say? So are you ready for statement number one? Yeah. Statement one, number one is found in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Anybody ever hear that statement before? <laughs> I think we've probably all heard that statement before. Out of all the statements that I've been looking at, I chose, I chose this one to be the first statement to look at because... It says so much in these 19 words. This is an eternal statement that is matter of fact and undisputable. The theologian once said, this is the ultimate foundation for a satisfactory philosophy of life. It proclaims the simple yet uh, complex truth of who Jesus is. So today I just want to break it down. I want to break down this statement, but we're going to break it down with an understanding that this is a connected statement, right? See, Jesus is not saying that at times he is the way, and at other times he is the truth, and still at other times he is the life. Maybe where you are in your walk, maybe where you are in your life, maybe, maybe you just need this segment of Jesus and he'll be that segment to you. No, that's not what it's saying. It's connective. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All at once, all the time. See, Jesus is absolutely all of these. He's absolutely all of these every millisecond of eternity. How Jesus starts this statement is both important, but it should also be comforting in how he starts it. See, when Jesus says, I am, see, it says, I am. Before we get to what he is, Jesus states, I am. He makes this statement personal, but he also makes it authoritative to the listener. See, it's authoritative in the sense of him being the master of life. Only Jesus has the ability to make this statement. He is authoritative in this statement. See, Jesus is not simply claiming to know the way, to know the truth, or where to find life. He's not pushing a, a philosophy to the unknowing or the lost. Jesus here is personally stating that it is him who is the solution, the definitive answer to all of humans' problems. By making the I am statement, Jesus is introducing this, this wonderful, per perplexing, beautiful, hard-to-grasp idea that instead of following a routine or a religion, we are to pursue a relationship with him. I am. I am speaking to you. I am speaking to you personally. I know what I'm talking about because I am what I am talking about. Jesus then states that he is the way. Jesus makes, that's a bold statement, right? Jesus is stating that he is the way. See, the, the word, the Greek u word used here for, for way, it implies a, a road for travel, right? A road for, for travel. So if it's like, hey, I, I want to go to Missoula, I'm going to map that out, and I know what road to take. I know what way to take. So when Jesus states that he is the way, he's talking about, hey, this is the, the route. This is the, the way to travel. This is the road that you need to be on. So, that, so we can come to this idea that, that within our Christian faith, Christ actually and absolutely is the way. And when we start a relationship with him, we are moving or traveling both with him and also in him. He is the way to the Father, right? Jesus is the way to the Father, but Jesus is also the journey, right? See, as Christians, we can, we can sometimes forget 
half of that statement. It's like, oh, I want, I want to go to heaven. I think it'd be great to go to heaven. And Jesus is the way to get to heaven. Therefore, Jesus, when I die, I want to go to heaven. And, and we forget the other half of that, that, that from that prayer to the time we enter into heaven, there's this beautiful journey that we're on and we're supposed to be on, and that's a day-to-day -day relationship with Jesus Christ. See, Jesus isn't just the destination. Jesus is also the journey. Amen. Now, Jesus can state, Jesus can state that he is the way to the Father because he is the only one who has the knowledge of the Father and who, because of his ultimate sacrifice, sacrifice where he was untainted by sin. He died for us so that he can not only get us to the ultimate destination, but he can, we can travel with him in that ultimate journey. How beautiful is that to think of Jesus as the way, the road. He is with us every step on that road. And then he is with us every millisecond that we spend in eternity. Jesus is the way. Then Jesus goes on to state that he is the truth. Boy, that's, a, that's an interesting statement nowadays, right? Has this been fact-checked? Jesus states that he is the truth. Fact-checked by Facebook, and we find that. No, he's just a truth. Wrong. Jesus is stating that he is the truth. See, in no way is, is Jesus just a truth, but rather Jesus is absolute truth. That's a hard one to grasp, right? And sometimes newer Christians and, and those that kind of have, hey, I got a foot over here in Christianity and I got a foot over here in a lot of other things, well, if you got a foot over here in these other things, what is that doing to this realization that Jesus is absolute truth? See, God is always truth. God is always true. What he speaks in here is, is not a lie. You will find lies in the Bible, but they are not being spoken by God because God is always truth. From eternity past to eternity future, God is truth. So how does, that, how does that work in my own life? I can say, okay, I'll give it to you. God, God is truth. I, okay, God is truth, but how does that truly affect me? Well, think of it this way. Adam's original sin did not impact or change the truth, but rather it changed mankind's ability to understand and implement truth into our lives. Have you ever thought of it that way? Adam's original sin did not impact or change truth. It didn't. What he did, what Adam and Eve did, the fall of man, that did not impact or change God's truth, but rather it changed mankind's ability to understand and implement truth into our lives. Because God so loved the world, he sent his son, Emmanuel, God with us, with truth. He came to love us. And part of that love is, is allowing us to, to begin to gain an understanding of God's truth. See, we now have the ability, because of Jesus, to come into a relationship with truth. Have you ever thought of it that way? We have the ability to come into a relationship with God's truth. The truth helps us to see the bigger picture. And Jesus has the power to show us that the ups and downs of life are relative because of his truth. We have a, a greater understanding of who Jesus is and the truth that he is. We understand that, that, that sometimes in our Christian faith, in our Christian life, things are gonna happen. Great things are gonna happen, 
bad things are going to happen. But if we have this greater understanding of truth, we understand what the bigger picture is, the eternal picture. And that allows us to stick with his truth. See, we, we, we hear all this. We read all this. And sometimes when we break verses down, we say, oh, man, Jesus is the truth. I'm going to stick on that one. Jesus is the truth. But remember, this is a compounding statement. Jesus is the way. So we are on the road or the journey with Jesus that ultimately leads to eternity. But while we are on the road, we are also becoming coherent in God's truth. It so works together in such a beautiful relationship. That's why as a Christian with a Christian worldview. I would say that I have a, a biblical Christian worldview. Because of that, I can look at the current cultural landscape, things that are going on today, and honestly, it looks very foreign to me. It's like, this isn't what I know. The way people are, are treating each other, that's, that's not what I know. The lies and the deception, that, that's not what I'm, that's foreign to me. Because I know something that's very different. See, the sin and immorality is exposed for what it is because I'm seeing things and they're being filtered through truth. The things of this world, those crazy things that I can't understand. But wait a second, before I had Jesus, I could not only understand them, but I could live in that. I could embrace that. But something happened when I came to Jesus and I got on this, this road with Jesus. I, I started to journey with Jesus. I started to, to talk with Jesus. I started to live with Jesus. And then all of a sudden my perception changed because Jesus started to implement his truth into my life. And now I stand back and I look, look at the world and think, what has happened? It's crazy. What is going on? It's all because I'm looking through the lens of truth. And then Jesus makes perhaps the most profound claim out of this whole passage. He says, and the life. Jesus is the way. Okay, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Okay, Jesus is the truth. Then he says, and the life. See, Jesus is not just claiming to be life, but rather Jesus is claiming to be the life. The term life seems so, so big to us, doesn't it? I mean, how do you explain life? Here's a biblical definition of life. Life real and genuine. A life active and vigorous, devoted to God, blessed in the portion, even in this world, of those who put their trust in Christ, but after the resurrection, to be consummated by new elevations, among them a more perfect body, and to last forever. We can now say that Jesus is the absolute fullness of life, both essential, essential life, as in our ability to exist, but also the, the ethical sense of life and how we, how we live our life. See, there's, there's two aspects to life. I can, I can take my pulse and I can say, hey, I can feel a heart rate. Okay, I'm breathing. I, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I must be alive, right? I'm, I'm physically alive, therefore I have life. I am existing. But there's this other part of life, and that's how I choose to conduct myself through this life. It's how I choose to live this life. Jesus encompasses both of those. He's the absolute fullness of both of those, both of which ultimately belong to God. See, Jesus is, is life in a, in a general, universal sense, and he is the life that is put into to us, the life that's put into me in a very personal sense. You just flip back in your Bibles to John 1, verse 1. It says, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him 
was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We can see that Jesus is God, that he is everlasting. He always was, and he always will be. The triune God has been in existence forever. By the word, by Jesus, everything was created. And within his creation was life. All life. All life pertains and is within Jesus. And life was the light of men. So in Christ, who is our creator, he intends that our life be for the purpose and power which are made available to us through Christ. You understand that? That's what's perplexing and, and hard to understand, that that true life is only available through us, to us, through Jesus. That's right. There, there's no other way. Am I saying that people without Jesus are not living a purposeful and true life? Am I saying that? Yeah, I'm saying that. I'm absolutely saying that. They are existing. They have a pulse. They're breathing. But they are not existing in the sense of having true life. It is only through Jesus that we can gain true life. See, Jesus, Jesus rebirths us. He rebirths the original life that was given to Adam. When, when, when God created Adam, hey, let's make man in our image. And he scoops all the dirt and the clay together and, and, and he breathes life into Adam. And that's, that, that was the plan that Adam was good. And let's, let's throw him down. It's Valentine's Day. Let's pull a rib out. Let's make Eve. And then Eve had life. Right? And, and, and that purpose was them is to, to exist in the garden. Man, hey, what, God, what do you want me to do? I want you to name the animals. How fun would that have been? That would have been so fun to name the animals. They were full of life. They didn't understand or comprehend sin. They didn't get a sore knee. Right? They didn't, they didn't have depressed thoughts. They didn't have any of those things. There was no death. Because, because when Adam was made... Life was breathed into him. But then the fall came. God said, man, you can do anything, just don't do this. So what do they do? They go and do that, and sin enters into the world. And with sin comes the opposite of life, which is death. And from that original sin all the way to right now, we are born into a sinful world. We don't automatically have life breathed into us. Rather, we have to go to Jesus and we have to say, Jesus, I'm a sinful person. I live in a sinful, fallen world. I admit to you that I am that, but I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you are the atonement. I believe by your blood that I can be saved and redeemed. So Jesus, I confess with my lips and I believe in my heart that you are the Son of God and that you died for me. Please come into my life. In essence, is what we're saying is, Jesus, breathe your life back into me the way it was supposed to be from the beginning. See, we are literally to be born again into life. Amen. We hear that word, we throw that word around. Hey, are you a born again Christian? Are you a born again Christian? How can I do that? Can I climb back up into my mother's womb and actually, no, you're thinking physical and I'm talking spiritual. You gotta be a born again Christian. And when you are born again, your mouth opens and you breathe in that glorious breath that God gives to you. It's the breath of life. By his own blood, we are reconciled with the Father we are also reconciled with life, true life. The life that Jesus wants to give each one of us. See, Jesus can claim to be 
the life because he was never subject to, to death, but rather made death subject to him. When he walked this earth, Jesus did not live with with this idea of death as the ultimate end of life, like atheists, like an atheist would. Yes, an atheist, what happens when you die? They tell you the worms are going to eat you, and it's just over, right? So they live their, their, their existence upon this earth with the idea that it ends. But Jesus said that's not how it ends. See, Jesus Jesus died in order to demonstrate and testify to the power of his life. I lay it down, but I'm going to pick it back up, right? After three days, you're going to see me again. I'm going to rise. And that's something that we are to embrace, this idea of life, everlasting life, that the physical life that we have right now is not our existence. Rather, our existence is our spirit that God breathes life into. Jesus is not boasting. He's not bragging about being the life. Rather, he is stating a truth. He's stating a fact. And Jesus is the only one that can state this truth. And again, it's a, it's a compounding statement. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The journey, the reality, and the ability, it's all wrapped up in this statement and in these attributes of Christ. And it is because he is the way he is the truth, and he is the life that allows Jesus to make the continued statement that no one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus is literally the way to the Father. He is the truth of the Father, and he is the life, the everlasting life. And it is only because of him and him alone that we have any chance of reconciling and coming to the Father. So many people make statements that they are this or that. If you listen to people talk, you will hear them talk about all these different things. Their, their identity is tied up into to all these different things, right? I, I, I'm a doctor. I'm not really a doctor. I'm, I'm a lawyer. Craig's a lawyer. I'm a, I'm a garbage man. I'm, I'm Scottish. I come from Africa. I, I, we make all these different statements. I am, I am a golfer. I'm a fly fisherman. Um, I work here. I work there. Uh, we like to make, make all these different statements about this or that. See, human nature screams at us to be pridefully unique or to be different than others, right? That's why, man, this... This whole generation, man, every kid from, I'm going to say 17 to, to 30, they've all got a tattoo, right? Because they want to be uniquely different. They want a uniquely different tattoo. And, and man, I'm going to get some piercings, and I'm going to dye my hair crazy colors. And, but we all do it because, because the human nature screams at us. Be different. you got to be unique. you got to be pridefully unique. But Jesus, being so far above us, is not stating a narrow arrogance here, but rather he is declaring his uniqueness as the Son and the sole access to the Father. I find it interesting that this world longs to be unique and it seeks their uniqueness through the mess and the filth of this world. Perversions. Even, even prejudices, right? Yet all the while, it is God who has already created us to be uniquely different. But we cannot understand and appreciate our uniqueness until we pursue the way, the truth, and the life. It is Christ himself who leads us back to the Father. What a profound and wonderful statement that is. So, 
you know, I look, I look at this world and I look through the eyesight and my filter of truth. And within that, I see people acting all different ways, crazy ways. The lies, the deception, the violence of what they're doing, the cheating, the lying, the stealing, and, and all of those things. <clears throat> but I have to take a step back when I see that. And I have to fight being judgmental toward that. How can I blame those people when they're not using a filter through the truth of Jesus Christ to go about their every day? It's a little difficult sometimes. Sometimes I want to say stuff. Sometimes I want to do stuff. But how can I blame them if they are not using the filter of truth, the word of Jesus, to conduct themselves on a day to day basis. So we as Christians, we have to pray for them. You know, there's all sorts in the Bible talking about praying for our enemies, praying for the lost, praying for the dead in Christ. But boy, that can get challenging sometimes. I'm just being, I'm being honest here. But I think we all need to come to an understanding that if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then without Jesus... They have no way. They have a misguided idea of truth, and they only have death. And we can get upset at them about how they're conducting ourselves, or we can begin to, to uh, extend compassion to them because they are walking through this life, wandering around with no definitive way. They aren't on the same journey we are. They don't have a relationship with Jesus where they can talk to him on a daily basis because they have no idea about Jesus. Is Jesus 100% available to them? He is 100% of the time. But for some reason, they haven't embraced Jesus. So, so they're wandering around. It's like dark outside and, and they're bumping into things and, and they're embracing whatever they can find. And that's... That's the works of the devil. That's evil. That's worldly junk. And how would you like to go through life without the security and the safety of God's truth? Man, I can base my life on this book. I'm going through something crazy. I know the answer is in this book. Amen. The truth gives me great security. And, and, and you, know, I, 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 you know, I joke around about pro presenter and all that and, and being rigid and wanting to know the plan and, and all of that. I want to know how things are going to wind up after we build this thing or that thing. And, and after we go through this, I want to know what the outcome is. Well, guess what I can find in the Bible? I can turn to the end. I can turn to the last chapter and I can find out what happens. It's not a surprise. God's not unveiling it. Hey, surprise! No, I know the answer. Yes. I know what happens. I know the end of the book. We have a whole world out there that's, that's again, it's existing without, without any life. Don't you look at the world right now and you look at people and think, man, they are just going through the motions. Yeah. They are just getting through every day and they're barely getting through every day. They have no hope because hope comes with life and a life that's more abundant, abundant in Christ. So we not only take this understanding that, that Jesus says, I am, I am, personally I am, I attest to all of this, I know I'm the expert, um, I encompass all of this, so now I'm stating it to you that I am the way, the truth, and the life. We take that, that understanding, we take that statement that Jesus made, and we apply it to our life, full well understanding that no one comes to the Father except through me. So we gain that for our own personal um, journey, our own personal understanding, but we can't leave it there. Because then we have to start applying it to those that are around us. Do they know the person of Jesus? Do they have a relationship with Jesus in order to be on the way, to understand the truth, and to experience the life? And if that doesn't start to birth compassion within us, an evangelistic compassion, that everybody, everybody needs to know this Jesus that I know. Everybody needs to know the way, the truth, and the life. If, if, if it doesn't progress to that, then we have to have an understanding that, that there's something that I'm not quite understanding 
in the first part. See, we gotta continue, we gotta still understand that this is a continuous statement, right? And I think we can gain an appreciation as well as a confidence within, within the individual statements. So we gotta, we gotta ask ourselves, what am I going to take away from today? What am I going to take away from this first statement of Jesus? Well, number one, I think we need to understand that, well, Jesus is personal. Jesus is personal. He's not a far off God or philosophy to, to try to reach, to try to understand, to try to dissect. No, Jesus is personal. And... Jesus longs for a personal, no, not yet, relationship with me. He's not only a personal God, but, but he wants to be personal with me. Have you ever gotten real personal with God? Have you guys in here ever done that? A lot of you guys, man, I've been going to church forever. I'm a Christian, but have you, have you truly gotten personal with God? He encourages and desires us to, to pursue him in a personal relationship. If, if, if somebody says, hey, what's more important, uh, memorizing the Bible or having that personal relationship with God, it's good to memorize the Bible. But there's a lot of people who can memorize the Bible but never have the personal relationship that God is extending to each one of us. So we understand that Jesus is personal and longs for a personal relationship with us. Secondly, Secondly, Jesus is the way, both the way to the ultimate destination as well as the journey. This is a hard one to understand. This is a hard one to, to, to really live out. Jesus not only wants us to have this eternal perspective. Man, I'm telling you right now, Jesus wants you in heaven for eternity. There is no doubt about that. He wants you in heaven for eternity so much that he was, will be, he was willing to, to give up what he had to be born into this world, to walk around in a dusty climate for 33 years, to be questioned, to be let down, to be belittled, to be spit on, to be beaten, and to eventually be crucified and to die for you. Jesus wants that for you. He wants you to have the ability to spend eternity with him, but he also wants you to enjoy every day with him. Amen. How many times do we forget <coughs> to enjoy every day with Jesus? Hey, I'm having a real bad day, but I'm enjoying it with Jesus. He's, I'm with him. I'm on his road. You know, all this stuff going on over there, it's crazy. It can kind of affect me, but it can't knock me off the road that I'm on. And the road that I'm on is an everyday journey with Jesus to a destination of eternity with Jesus. I think it's important to take that away today. Third, Jesus is the truth in a world full of confusion, deception, and fear. Man, it's like two years ago, five years ago, it's like, man, how much more crazy can this get? And then 2020, yeah, 2020 is coming. 2020, that's symbolic of perfect vision. Well, what's the perfect vision showing us, right? That the world is full of confusion, deception, and fear. You are not going to gain any, any security or safety focusing on this world. But what should give us great security is to know that we can count on the everlasting and absolute truth of God. What he says in his word is guaranteed for eternity. Stake your life upon this book and throw everything else away. I'm talking everything. I don't care who wrote other books. I don't care what other people said. Man, if it doesn't attest to what's in this book, throw it away. Because this is the book that you need. Fourth, Jesus is life. Everlasting, eternal life. But also life right now. Right? Jesus is life right now. If you feel like you're not living right now, man, God has infused that within you. He has breathed that within you. You need to take a breath 
of the word of God. You need to fill your lungs with the truth of God. You need to allow that life to come into you so you can step out and start living that life. And how does living a life uh, full of his life actually look? It looks pretty exciting, right? Yeah, I don't want to go to church. I know those Christians, they're so boring. They're so boring. They're all just, man, they're all pushovers. They just, they go and they sing together a little bit crazy. And, and then they read their little Bible all day long. And then they try to tell people about Jesus. I'm not doing that. That doesn't sound fun. I would rather embrace the, the lifestyle of the world. I'd rather get drunk on Saturday night and be hung over on a Sunday morning. Who says that? Right? I'd rather spend all this money in this addiction or that. Man, you're filtering your eyesight through something that's not the truth of God. Because when his life comes into you, it's like, man, I just, I just need to spend some time with God. I know how when you guys get in your cars and no one else is in the car and you turn on the Christian radio station, you're like, eh, I don't really sing in church, but man, you're driving down the road. I see you. I look in there and it's like, whoa, man. They're, they got a worship station on. They're going crazy. They love getting with God because it's the life. They're embracing that. And man, when you go to your devotions in the morning, it's like, man, I'm reading through the Bible this year and I've never understood that. I've never understood. And God's saying this and, and this situation's happening. What's happening is you're rediscovering what life actually is. See, there's this huge misconception of what life is. Oh, you got to do everything you can because you only get one world around. So you can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. If it makes you feel good, then it's good, right? Wrong. That's not the life that God has for you. And then that life builds in us and it consumes us. And how can we not talk about our best friend? How can we not talk about our Savior? How can we not talk about the way, the truth, and the life? When he breathes that in us, man, that's all that we think about, right? It's all that we think about. It's like, yeah, I got to do my job, but while I'm at my job, I'm thinking about Jesus. And while I'm, oh, I got my paycheck, and now I'm thinking, hey, I got my paycheck, but what else could I do with this paycheck? Hey, I got vacation. Hey, I could take vacation and go, go somewhere and, and have it for me, and that's okay. Sometimes we need that, but there's other times where it's like, hey, I'm going to use my vacation to go on a missions trip or think, I'm going to pay somebody so I can go work for them for 12 hours a day, back-breaking labor. And you're going, but that's life, man, because I'm doing it for Jesus. Totally changes our perspective. Jesus is life. Everlasting, eternal life, but life right now. So let's enjoy this journey. And number five, Jesus is the only option. Sometimes we just need to hear that. Sometimes we need to reinforce that into our own life. Jesus, Jesus is the only option. What a narrow-minded statement, isn't it? Wrong. Jesus, because of who he is, is the only one that has full authority to make this statement. That he is the, he is the only option. There are no other options. You can't seek other philosophies and, and religions and, and find life. You can't, you can't study all the, the books that were ever written besides the Bible and, and gain an understanding of, of truth. You can't work out 10 hours a day and think that you are gonna experience life. See, there's a difference between life and health. I think health comes under life, but it's, it's the life in Christ that we, that we long for, that we seek. So instead of seeing this statement that, that Jesus is the only option, instead of seeing that as, as staunch or strict, we need to see it as life-changing. We need to see it as wonderful. We need to never lose the appreciation of just how amazing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ actually is. So in, we take this, this first statement of Jesus, we take it as a whole, 
right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. We take that as a beautiful statement, not just something we hang on the wall or write in our Bible, but we, we actually begin to believe that and we begin to live that out as, a, as, a, as an entire statement. But, but then we also, we also key in on the individual aspects of that. Maybe in our prayer life, we just think, we thank the personal Jesus. Thank you for being the I am in my life. Yes. Thank you for desiring a personal relationship with me. And then we can move on. Man, Jesus, thank you that you allow me to travel with you through through this journey, through this time that I'm, I'm physically here on earth. Jesus, I don't want to ever be be up, uh, opposed to that. I don't. I don't want to take the exit ramp off the road that you have me on. I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to stop at the 7-Eleven for, for a week or two and just do my own thing. But Jesus, I want to, I want to continually be, be with you on, on this road. On Hear the way. Where else would I go? Where else could I go to experience that? And, and Jesus, thank you that you allow me to filter everything that I see Filter that through your truth. Boy, that's something that we all need to embrace and jump on. We really need to be, be uh, filtering everything through truth. See, I, I, I listen to what's going on in this world, in this nation right now. And sometimes, sometimes in the back of my mind, I think, well, what if I'm, what if I'm the messed up person? What if I'm the one that's looking at everything wrong? What, what, if, what if it's not that bad to, to, to abort babies and, and things like that? What, what if it's not that, that bad and there's nothing wrong with, with allowing a 10-year-old kid to determine if they're a boy or a girl? What if, what, if, what if I'm the one that's wrong in all that? You know, sometimes, you ever get that? It's like, what if it's me? What if I'm the screwed up one? But then, but then the life is breathed into me. And I'm quickly reminded that, that I'm filtering everything through absolute truth. Yeah. I'm filtering everything, not, not, just, not just through God's, God's ideas and ideals, but the actual attributes of who God is. And then I start to think, well, I don't want to be arrogant in this, but because I have Jesus, I really think that, that my viewpoints on these these issues are the biblical viewpoints. And if this is the authoritative word of God, then that backs that up. So now that I'm beginning to understand that truth, I can apply that and I can stand on a firm foundation because most of the things that the world throws at you, they change, they evolve or devolve. God's truth never does. And then I keep praying and I say, say, God, oh my God, thank you so much for my life. Not my life, but, but the life that you have put in me. Thank you that, that what was lost in the garden, I can recapture through Jesus in my life right now. If you're thinking that eternal life starts when you take your last breath or get raptured here on earth, if you think that eternal life doesn't start until then, you're, you're, missing, you're missing it. Eternal life starts when you choose to follow Jesus, to journey with Jesus, to accept the truth that Jesus has for you. Eternal life starts at the moment of your rebirth. So start living, start acting, and start talking like you've experienced that. Worship team, come on, come on up here. So as with the questions, the 10 questions, it's, it holds true to these, these 10 statements that we are going to go through. What it comes down to is, is this idea and this understanding of, of what will you choose? Today, what will you choose to do with this first statement? How will you, how will you take that statement? Will you argue against that statement? Will you say, well, I, I, I believe 75% of that statement is true. Nah, maybe 50-50. Yeah, about half of it is. Well, that's good for everyone else. Or you take this first statement that we just looked at, and will you choose to, to apply that into your life? Will you choose to believe that 
Will you choose to speak that? Will you choose to, to purposely pursue a walk with Jesus, a daily journey with him? Will you ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate your, your mindset and your eyesight through the focus of his truth? We ask Jesus every day, Jesus, yesterday was a hard day. Give me another dose of that truth. Breathe it in like you take that oxygen mask and you shove it over your face and you just inhale that life that he's wanting to give to you. Will you do that on a daily basis? Will you come to the definitive understanding that, that Jesus is unique and within his uniqueness, he is the only way to the Father and thus eternal life? Do we take these, these, this fundamental statement, fundamental statement number one, and stake everything that we know upon it? I can't answer for each one of you, but as for me in my house, man, we will serve the Lord. We will trust in the Lord, and we will believe this first statement. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a what an amazing eternal statement. And Lord, I believe that this was and is and forever will be an eternal statement. Lord, from the beginning, from the instant that Adam and Eve fell, you had a plan. You had a plan to bring your son into this world. And he wasn't he wasn't just a being. He wasn't, he wasn't an angel. He wasn't a man. But he literally was the way, the truth, and the life. He was God incarnate. He was God with us. And Lord, thank you for walking this earth and teaching. Lord, the value of your statements in the three years of ministry are overwhelming. Three years. You stated eternal truth and Lord God we have that we have it written down and, and Lord I am so glad that, that I can hold my Bible right now Lord that this this book isn't isn't rare to me like it is in some other countries but Lord God I can take this book of truth of life and I can get in it every day I can read it I can meditate on it. I can, I can pray through it. Lord, thank you so much that you have, you have blessed us so much in this country to be able to do that. But Lord God, I can't leave it there. Lord God, how does that affect me in my, in my drive and my compassion to, to proclaim who you are to the ends of the earth, but starting right here. So Lord God, this morning I do that. I proclaim, I proclaim for everybody in here listening and everybody online listening and, and as far out as you can get it, I am proclaiming that Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. It's only you that we can have reconciliation with the Father and you are uniquely capable of atoning for our sins. And Lord God, I thank you for that. I thank you that you are not subject to death, but, but rather you have conquered death. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you allow me to walk with you on a daily basis. Lord, I, I sometimes walk too slow, but Lord God, you slow down for me. And Lord God, sometimes I walk too fast and you gently just grab me and pull me back. You say, this is my pace and it is appropriate for you. But Lord God, this morning, I just thank you for all of these things. And Lord God, help me to be more fervent in my faith, to have that foundational truth and understanding and the compassion to speak it forward. Jesus, you're unlimited. You're amazing. You're beautiful. And Jesus, we pray this in your name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Now go out and live the life that God has breathed into you. Look through the filter of truth and every day be on that journey with him. What an amazing, amazing gift he gave us. Lord, have compassion on those who don't have 
Jesus in their life. Because you have everything. And they literally have nothing. Do we keep that everything to us? No. We present it. Amen. Be blessed. Stay warm. And we'll see you next week for statement number two. This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to bridgehelena.com. And we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.